Well, good morning, IBC. So great to see all of you here and wanna say a word of welcome to those who are watching online. I don't know if you guys ever see on our Facebook feed, we have people that check in that are watching from literally all over the country and even in other parts of the world. So if you're watching online, we're glad that you're here. We're all here uh, for the third week in our sermon series that we're calling Questionable. That idea for the series comes out of a verse of scripture that's found in uh, 1 Peter chapter three, where Peter says, always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks the reason for the hope that you have within you. And the idea that Peter conveys there is that we are to live as Christians distinctly in ways that cause the world around us to, to wonder about us, to, to question us, to, to wonder who are these people? Why do they live this way? Why do they value what they value? Why do what they live the way that they live? And in designing this series several months ago, I may have made a questionable decision because today we're gonna to talk about politics. If that makes you nervous sitting out there hearing me say that, you should try standing up here and saying it, right? This is an issue that is, that is fraught with all kinds of peril. There's all kinds of landmines for us to talk about this issue, but frankly, if everybody else is talking about it and we're not talking about it, there's a problem. And so this morning, we're, we're gonna talk about this. And I want to reassure you right from the get-go, I have no interest whatsoever in trying to tell you how you should vote, what party you should support, how you should uh, align yourself politically. That's, that's not my task this morning. And some of you, I think, are going, thank you. I'm glad to know that. That's not my task. In fact, part of my task is to tell you why we're not going to do that. But what I'm trying to do this morning is pastor our very diverse community through what is a, a complicated, turbulent season in the life of our nation and therefore in the life of our church. The easiest churches to lead and the easiest churches to be a part of are those churches where everybody thinks the same and where everybody votes the same. And I don't know if you know that or not, but Irving Bible Church is not one of those churches. I, I look out in this room every Sunday and I see, na I see faces, I know names, I, I know people, some of whom are, are, are very um, politically liberal and they are so because of their deeply held Christian convictions. And I look out in this room and I see faces and I know names of people who are very politically conservative and they are so for their deeply held Christian convictions. And frankly, they can't understand how the other person got where they are. And then there are many who f find ourselves here somewhere in the kind of complicated, messy middle. Some who perhaps uh, identify very much with the sentiment expressed in an obituary for a woman named uh, Marianne Norton. Marianne Norton's uh, obituary, Nolan, her obituary in the Richmond Times Dispatch says this. Faced with the prospect of voting for either Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton, Mary Ann Nolan of Richmond chose instead to pass into the eternal love of God <laughs> on Sunday, May 15th, 2016, at the age of 68. We have people in this church, people in this room right now, who find themselves at all kinds of different points along the political spectrum, that we're not one of those churches where everybody here thinks the same or, or votes the same. And I think that is a really good thing because I think it uniquely affords us an opportunity to live together, to find unity in the midst of our diversity that is truly questionable, that makes the world around us wonder about us. How can we find such unity in the midst of our diversity? And so this morning, my, my ask of you is, would you give me a listen? Would you take a deep breath, maybe lower your defenses, not listen uncritically, but just to listen, to, to not jump to conclusions or, or, or make assumptions, but to allow me the opportunity to, to try to pastor this very diverse congregation through what is a complicated season. 
For me, the need to speak to this, the, the need to come and, and address this really emerges for a couple of reasons. One is, over the last nine months that I've been the senior pastor here at IBC, I've received more email about political issues than I think just about anything else. That I've received emails from people on both sides of the political spectrum asking me, asking IBC to, to speak more about things we like or speak less about things that we don't. And I think it's irresponsible for us not to be talking about this and not to, not to address directly and clearly the way in which we intend to proceed together. There's a second reason that I think it's important for us to be talking about this now. I, I don't know if you realize what's happening one year from today. But one year from today in the United States, we will be showing up to the the polling booth. We'll be showing up to cast our votes in the next presidential election and a whole host of other items that'll be on that, uh, on that ballot. And the course of the next 12 months has the potential to be very disruptive and even divisive in our friendships, in our families, and even within our congregation. And so I think it's really important for us to talk about how we will be navigating these turbulent waters in this heightened political season. So would you allow me over the next few minutes just to try to, to pastor us as a community around some really difficult, delicate subjects? I wanna begin by just reaffirming very clearly, very explicitly, who we are and who we will continue to be. And that is to say, we are and will continue to be a church that is centered on Jesus, a church that is grounded in God's word, and a church that is focused on pursuing God's kingdom work of transformation in our lives and in the world around us. And we will not let any political agenda, any political issue get in the way of our being that kind of church. Yes that we are and will continue to be a church that is centered on Jesus. And so despite the fact that there is all kinds of diversity within our community, what brings us together, what, what binds us together is that we are centered on Jesus. We're gonna be a church that continues to be grounded in God's word, that God's word has things to say to us, to challenge us, to encourage us, to, to inform the way in which we think about and engage in the political sphere around us. And so we're going to be a church that has continued to be grounded in God's word. And we're going to be a church that continues to be focused on pursuing God's kingdom work of transformation in our lives and the world. And we're not gonna let a crazy election or a crazy political season or any kind of political issue get in the way of us being that kind of church. With that said, I think it's important for us to recognize two um, affirmations that I think go together hand in hand. And one is this. We, as a church, cannot be non-political. But we, as a church, must be non-partisan. Right? We, as a church, cannot be non-political, but we, as a church, must be non-partisan. Now, hang with me, and let me help you understand what I mean by that. First of all, in both of those affirmations, when I say as a church, what I'm talking about is the things that we say publicly and collectively, corporately. The things that you'll hear from this stage are the things that we're uh, communicating as a church. It doesn't mean that, that you as individuals ought not have some sense of um, identification or affiliation with a particular political party. But we as a church, on the one hand, cannot be non-political, but we must be non-partisan. When I say we can't be non-political, here's what I mean by that. The, the uh, more uh, traditional, ancient notion, classical notion of politics isn't our two-party system that we think of today, but the more ancient notion is simply the way in which we order our common lives together. That the word politic comes from the Greek word polis, which means city. So this way of speaking emerged as a way of talking about the way that the city ordered its common life together. And so if we think about what it means to be political as having to do with the way in which we order our lives together as communities and as a society... The Bible has profound implications for the way in which we order our lives collectively as communities and as a society. The gospel has profound implications. And we're committed to 
teaching the Bible. We are committed to preaching the gospel. And therefore, we can't avoid those parts of scripture that speak to the way in which we ought to order our lives together as communities and as society. We're committed to being a church that is grounded in God's word. And so when the word of God speaks, we will speak. We can't be non-political. It's neither possible or desirable. And yet, we must be nonpartisan. That is, in teaching the scriptures, in looking at what the Bible has to say about the way in which we order our lives together as communities and as a society, we must avoid promoting any political party, platform, policy, or politician. That we must be nonpartisan. And I think there are three reasons why we as a church must be nonpartisan. First, we never want partisan politics to get in the way of somebody coming to know Jesus. That we as a church will remain nonpartisan because we don't ever want politics. We don't ever want partisan politics to get in the way of somebody coming to know Jesus. I heard recently a a pastor who said he was asked, is this a left-wing church or a right-wing church? And he said, we're a church for the whole bird. (laughs) And I want Irving Bible Church to be a church for the whole bird. I want people to be able to come here and hear the message of the gospel and never to think that they have to follow this political party or that political party before they can follow Jesus. That we don't ever want partisan politics to get in the way of somebody hearing the message of the gospel, coming to know Jesus, learning to trust and follow him, and being sent into the world as his missionary disciples. We will not be partisan because we don't ever want partisan politics to get in the way of somebody coming to know Jesus. But the second reason that I think that we have to, um, we must be nonpartisan is that the path from biblical principles to public policy isn't always straight and clear, right? The path from biblical principles to public policy isn't always straight and clear, As we explore the scriptures, it has a lot to say about the way in which we order our lives together, but translating those principles into policy is complicated. And there's room for well-intended Christians who are equally committed to the trustworthiness and the authority of scripture to disagree and to engage in, in healthy debate about how to translate the principles of the Bible into public policy convictions. And so we as a church won't be partisan because that path from biblical principle to public policy isn't always straight and clear. And the third reason that we must remain as a church nonpartisan is in my notes. (laughs) The third reason is this. We must be nonpartisan because the way of Jesus doesn't always fit nicely with the politics of either the left or the right. That there are times where the way of Jesus offers critique of both. I grew up listening to a a Christian singer-songwriter, Rich Mullins, whose whose music and whose life really impacted me. And, And he had a statement that he made that I find myself going back to time and time and time again. I was using it in class with my seminary students just this last week. Um, It's not a statement about politics, but I think it has implications for the way in which we think about politics. And, And his statement is this. I must always be aware of what my perspective is so that I can both appreciate it and be a little distrustful of it. Right? I must always be aware of what my perspective is so that I can both appreciate it appreciate the convictions that I hold, appreciate how I came to those convictions, and have a certain kind of critical distance that allows me to continue to question and learn and grow. And I think that that we need to be people who, while we may have strong sense of identification with one party, one platform, or another, that we still, as Christians, stand with a certain kind of critical distance and are capable of recognizing when the way of our particular party doesn't fit with the way of Jesus. My hope and my prayer is that our deeply held Christian convictions will shape the politics of our respective parties rather than the politics of our respective parties shaping our Christian convictions. We must 
remain nonpartisan because we don't ever want partisan politics to get in the way of somebody coming to know Jesus. We must remain partisan, nonpartisan because the path from biblical principle to public policy is not always straight and clear, and we must remain nonpartisan because the one that was in my notes, right? Because the way of Jesus doesn't always fit with the politics of either the left or the right. Now, what I wanna do with the time that we have remaining is to shift and begin thinking about what ought to form and shape our political convictions. Some political first principles. Because I think that for us as believers, it's really important for us not to just find ourselves swayed by whatever is in the 24-hour news cycle, but actually at first go back and say, what are those core convictions that guide me as I seek to make sense of the political arena? And I wanna take you to a passage of scripture that I think offers for us three important political first principles that as the people of God, we all ought to share. Um, it's not all of the political first principles, but it offers us some key ones. And so if you have your Bible, you have it on your device, I wanna invite you to turn with me to the book of Micah. The book of Micah, chapter six. In the book of Micah, what you have is you have... Um, a time in the nation of Israel, in the eighth century BC, eighth century before Christ, a time which Israel as a nation was very prosperous, but they were not godly. They actually thought because they were prosperous, they must be okay with God, and yet God sent prophets like Micah and several others into that situation to call God's people to repentance. M Micah spoke into this situation, calling out God's people for their idolatry, and for their injustice, for their failure to love God with all they are and all they have and their failure to love their neighbors as themselves. And Micah writes, speaks to God's people, calling them to repentance and warning them that if they don't, they're gonna wind up finding themselves in exile. And what we have here in Micah chapter six is a little bit of a courtroom drama between God and his people. In the first five verses of Micah chapter six, God makes his case. And he says in essence to them, I've done all of this for you. How is it that you've, that you've turned for me? How is it that you've turned to, to, to trusting in other things, trusting in other gods? And how is it that you have neglected other people? How is it you've turned to idolatry and injustice? And then in verse six and seven, Israel makes their reply. And their reply essentially is to say, God, just give us a checklist Tell us what you want us to do and we'll do it. Whatever it is, God, we'll, we'll do it and then we can get on with our life. What they're, what they're doing is not asking how do we please God, but how do we appease God? How do we just check that off so we can get on with the rest of our lives and not have God interfere in the way that we're living? And then in verse eight, we get God's reply. And in verse eight, what we have is we have God's righteous requirements for his people. His righteous requirements for his people in the nation of Israel, and I believe his righteous requirements for us as his people today, that I think have profound implications for the way in which we think about engaging our political arena. In Micah chapter six, verse eight, we read these words. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Three, I believe, political first principles that ought to guide all of us as we think about how we engage the political arena. First, to act justly. God says to his people, this is my righteous requirement for you. Literally in the Hebrew it says, do justice or, or create justice. The word for justice there is the word mishpat in Hebrew. It's a very important word, shows up all over the place, the word mishpat. Can you say that with me? Mishpat. Mishpat carries with it the idea, certainly, of um, retributive justice, right? That is the idea of retribution. That is the bad guys getting what's coming to them. But the biblical notion of justice, the idea of mishpat, involves so much more than just retributive justice. It is really restorative justice. It's seeing things set right. Seeing things set the way that they're supposed to be. That the notion of mishpat is that, that impulse in the heart that says, this is wrong, something needs to be done about it, and then moving to do something. 
my uh, oldest child, Will, is uh, 17. He's about to graduate from high school. We actually just sent off a bunch of college applications this week before the November 1st deadline. And, and uh, it's kind of freaking us out that our, our oldest is uh, already graduating from high school. But one of the things that I admire most about my son, Will, one of the things that I just, I, I love in his heart is that he has this deep heart for justice. Always had. From the time he was a little kid, he's just had this sense about him that, that his heart says, that's wrong. Something needs to be done about it. And then he's one who moves to do something about it. We saw that from him from a, from a little age, a, a young age, when he was a, a toddler, uh, two or three, we were living in Wheaton, Illinois, outside of Chicago. And Kim took him to kind of a play group that was in a gym of a, a church close by. And she had some friends that she went and spent time with and their kids all uh, played together there in the gym. Well, at some point in this uh, play group, Kim got up and left for just a little while. And when she came back in, there was a child across the room who was just bawling, I mean, just in tears and being comforted by his mother. And, uh, and Kim comes over to the rest of the moms inquiring about what happened. And one of them kind of sheepishly said, Will bit him on the forehead. Um... Not acceptable behavior. Kim takes him off, gives him a, a very solid scolding, a talking to, sits him down, puts him in timeout. He's isolated. He can't play. He starts to cry. I mean, it's a, a, a dramatic scene. Now, hear me on this. I'm not suggesting that his behavior was okay. Not for a moment. But after Kim went and gave him his talking to and put him in timeout, she came back to the other moms and one of the moms turned to her and said, that kid deserved it. Once again, not condoning the behavior, but what was happening is that this little boy was bullying the other kids in the room. And there was something in Will's heart that said, that's not right. Something needs to be done about it. And he did something about it. <laughs> Just to be clear, not condoning the behavior, but there's something about that heart that reflects the heart of God. There's something about that heart that reflects the heart of God for his people, that we would be people who would say, that's not right. Something needs to be done. And then moving to do something about it. And when you look at this idea of mishpat, this idea of justice throughout the Bible, what you find is that oftentimes God's focus of calling his people to justice is specifically focused on the vulnerable and the marginalized in society. One place that we could go of, of a, a number of places to illustrate this is in Zechariah chapter nine, verse, or chapter seven, verse nine and 10. In Zechariah chapter seven, it says, this is what the Lord Almighty said, administer true justice, show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the foreigner or the poor, and do not plot evil against each other. And time and time and time again, throughout the Bible, these four come together, the poor, the widow, the, the orphan, the foreigner. Th that these were, in the nation of Israel, the most vulnerable or the most marginalized members of their society. And the Bible never blames them for being in that condition. The Bible just says that for the people of God, your heart should be moved for them and to say, this is wrong. And something needs to be done and then doing something about it. And once again, I want to say that it's possible for well-intended Christians to disagree about what public policies are best for the marginalized, the vulnerable of society. Room for well-intended Christians to disagree about the role of the church and the role of the state. But what there's not room for there's not room for any expression of politics that would call itself Christian that just doesn't care about the most vulnerable and marginalized members of society. God calls his people, all of his people. God calls all of us to be dedicated to moving toward those who are weak, who are vulnerable, who are marginalized. Regardless of our political affiliation, this ought to be for the people of God, a, a first principle. Who has shown you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice 
The second, he says, to love mercy. And this word mercy is uh, the word chesed. We've talked about that word around here before. It's that word, you gotta kind of do that little fluttery thing in your throat to, to say it right. It's the word chesed. Can you say that with me? Chesed. Um, more simply said, would just be to say it hesed. And, and the hesed of God normally is the way in which this is spoken of. It is God's love for his people. God's love that is, that is unrelenting, that is sacrificial, and that is gratuitous. Right? This is the way God loves people. God loves them in a way that, that, that never ends. It's a, a committed covenantal love. God's love for people is a, a, a love that is, that is gratuitous, that is not earned or deserved. There's nothing we could do to earn God's love. God's love is sacrificial. It is giving. There's nothing about the hesed of God that is deserved or earned by us. It is his mercy toward us. And what's interesting in this passage is that the word of God calls the people of God to show the world the same kind of love that they have received from God himself. That we are to be those who express mercy, express hesed to the world around us. Uh, Kyle Eidelman is a, a pastor who I uh, listen to from time to time, and, and he said it in a very interesting way. He said uh, that when we show people that they matter to us, they begin to see that they matter to Jesus. And when people see that they matter to Jesus, Jesus begins to matter to them. Isn't that a good way to put it? When, when we show people that they matter to us, then, then they begin to see that they matter to Jesus. And when they see that they matter to Jesus, Jesus begins to matter to them. We're called to be people who love the world around us the way that God has loved us. Who has shown you, O oh mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? To do justice, to love mercy. Not just to do it begrudgingly, but to love it, to delight in it. And then finally, to walk humbly with your God. And there's a whole lot more to, to humility than just having to do with the way in which we hold or express our political opinions, right? A whole lot more about walking humbly than just that, but it does have implications for that, doesn't it? The idea that we should walk humbly with God has implications for the way in which we hold and express our political opinions. And what's interesting is this idea of humility is a really big deal throughout the Bible. You can turn and look in the words of 1 Peter chapter 5 where the apostle Peter writes and says, all of you, Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. It doesn't say God is neutral toward the proud. It says God opposes the proud, but he gives favor to the humble. And so we are called to be a people who walk humbly with our God. And that means a whole lot more than the way in which we hold and express our political opinions, but it does have implications for that. Not that we hold weakly or loosely, but that we hold humbly. That we engage one another with grace. And I think at this point, it's also important to, to just remember that the way of Jesus is the way of self-giving, humble love. The way of politics is the way of coercive power. The way of Jesus is the way of self-giving, humble love. Pilate rode into town on a war horse. Jesus rode into town on a donkey. In Jesus' temptation, Satan takes Jesus up to a high place and shows him all the kingdoms of this world and says, I'll give all of this to you if you just bow down and worship me. I'll give you all of this power, power over the world. You don't have to go to the cross to get it. Just bow down and worship me. And Jesus says, that's not the way this is gonna play. I'm paraphrasing here, of course. Jesus says, the way this is gonna play is I've come to give my life as a ransom for many. That, that the way that Jesus transforms the world is not the way of power, but the way of humble, self-giving love. And when you look at the history of the church, when the church has transformed the world around them, when the church has experienced revival, it hasn't happened primarily through Christians holding or maintaining political power. It has happened primarily when Christians humble themselves before God. And cry out to God to move in their midst. 
and then declare and demonstrate to the world the humble, self-giving love of Jesus. This is the way in which Jesus changes the world. And, and hear me, I'm not in any way removing a sense of responsibility that we ought to feel to engage in the political process. Right? We have an incredible privilege and responsibility to engage in the political process. People around the world are literally dying for the kind of freedom that we enjoy. And people within our history have literally died to secure the freedom that we enjoy. We have a responsibility to engage. And I believe that our engagement in the process is part of the way in which we love our neighbors as ourselves. So we ought to take very seriously our, our opportunity, our privilege, and our responsibility, but we also ought to always remember that as Paul says to the Philippians, our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, Jesus Christ the Lord. That we are those who gather around one Lord and that he is the one who came and changed the world through humble, self-giving love. Who has shown you, O oh mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? To do justice to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Now, I wanna spend these last few minutes just offering you some practical ways, I think, in which we can respond to the call of God on our lives as it relates to our engagement in the world around us and our engagement in the political sphere. And the first call, I believe, to you and I, to us as a community, is to pray. And that's not a, a flippant just add in, well, that's, you're supposed to say that. No, I believe prayer changes things. I love the way that the theologian Karl Barth captures it when he says, to clasp the hands in prayer is the beginning of an uprising against the disorder of the world. We see the world around us is not the way that it's supposed to be. The way in which the world around us has gotten such a mess that our calling, our obligation as people of God is to pray. And we as the people of God are specifically commanded to pray for those in authority, those in leadership. That Timothy, Paul writes to Timothy and says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, and intercessions and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and for those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. We're commanded as the people of God to pray for those who are in authority, pray for those who are in leadership. So the question that I have for you this morning is, how's your prayer to complaint ratio. Because the Bible doesn't ever command us to complain about our leaders, but the Bible does command us to pray for them. Now that doesn't exclude the possibility of, of lament. It doesn't exclude the possibility of a sense of righteous indignation. And even in a country like the one that we live in, uh, the, the voice of protest. But our primary calling as the people of God is to be people of prayer, praying for those in authority. And we've talked about before the fact that Jesus kind of divides the world into two kinds of people, right? Neighbors and enemies. And his command to the one is to love them. And his command to the other is to love them. So I wanna challenge you to think about right now, to think about Someone in the political arena who you don't particularly like. Anybody come to mind? Right? Across this room, different people are coming to mind at this very moment. Here's what I want you to do. I want to challenge you. Write that name down. And I want you to pray for that person every day this week. Because the Bible commands us as the people of God to pray for leaders and those who are in authority. We need to be people of prayer. The second call for us is to listen, to be people who learn to listen well, who, who listen to diverse voices, diverse perspectives, to be careful about who we are listening to, that we're not just listening inside an echo chamber, but that we're actually listening to people who see things differently than we do, so that we might continue to learn and grow and, and not vilify those with whom we disagree that we would learn to listen to one another in our families, to learn to listen to one another in our communities, in our small groups, to learn to listen to one another in the church. I read a fantastic book this week that I would commend to all of you. It's a book that's written by two Christian women who have been friends since college, but they come down on opposite ends of the political spectrum. 
And yet they have engaged in this dialogue together and and started a podcast and now written a book. And the title of the book, I, I just love the title by itself. The title of the book is, I think you're wrong, but I'm listening. That's pretty suggestive right there. I think you're wrong, but I'm listening. And in that book, one of my favorite quotes, they say this. They say, whether you believe our country's problem is generational or geographical or partisan, the most important thing to know about the polarization in American politics today is that we are choosing it. We are choosing division. We are choosing conflict. We are choosing to turn our civic sphere into a circus. We are choosing all of this, and we can choose otherwise. Politics does not have to be driven by conflict and anger. We can eschew cynicism and engage in thoughtful debate. We can put away extreme arguments and nasty rebuttals and bring the same care and respect to policy discussions that we bring to the rest of our lives. Simply stated, there is a better way. There's a way to engage with respect and empathy. There's a way to give grace and be vulnerable when discussing the issues that affect your family, your church, and your country. There's a way to stop treating politics like a team sport and get to work solving the real problems that plague our world. There is a way to talk about politics that leaves you inspired instead of depleted. There's a way to engage with each other that could, as it has in the distant past, lead to consensus and solutions, innovations and improvements. There is, friends, a better way. And I believe that if we actually live that better way, if we as Christians model that better way, that it will indeed be questionable. That as believers in Jesus, as a a very diverse church that doesn't all think the same and doesn't all vote the same, we have an opportunity to show the world a different way to engage, a better way, a way that finds unity, even in the midst of our diversity, a way that values diversity, even as we work hard to maintain our unity. And I think that we do that as we together commit to be individuals and a church and engage in the political arena around us in a way that we're committed to doing justice and to loving mercy and to walking humbly with God. As we dedicate ourselves to be people who pray and who listen and finally who act because the world doesn't just need our voices and our votes The world needs our action. The world needs to see us demonstrating the mercy, the love of Jesus. And you heard earlier about some opportunities in which we can do that as a community. And I don't care who you vote for. We can serve together side by side, loving our neighbors, engaging with them in such a way that we can be a blessing, that we in this room can can go out and fill up those Thanksgiving meal bags. Our goal for this year is 600. I think the people in this room could beat that goal today that we can show this extravagant love of Jesus to the world around us and that we can show up and serve, be a part of that carnival where we bless our community with a fun evening and have the opportunity to distribute those bags. And we can not only respond in the midst of a a holiday season, but we can engage year-round with partners like Crisis Ministry that help address the ongoing um, food scarcity faced by our neighbors. You heard 85% of the kids in the schools around us or on free or reduced lunches. There's an opportunity for us. And it doesn't matter where we come down on the political spectrum. There's an opportunity for us to serve together side by side, making a difference in our community. To pray, to listen, and to act. And I think if we do, the world around us will begin to ask questions. Why do they live this way? And who is this God they serve? Let's pray together. Father, we we thank you for your chesed love expressed towards us, your uh, unrelenting and sacrificial and gratuitous love that draws us together, draws us together in unity as a church and that calls us as your people to be people who who do justice and who love mercy and who walk humbly with you. And Lord, I pray that in this time of response that you would stir in our hearts, God, that you would challenge and and convict and, and 
Allow us to uh, align ourselves with your desires for us and to work hard to pursue and promote unity within our body. I thank you for the beautiful diversity that is in this church, that is in this room right now. And I pray indeed that you would draw us together and help us to show the world a different way, a better way. We pray all this in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus. Amen.